Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. I'm Sabrina Spitaletta from the Milken Institute, and you are at the session focused on combating the opioid crisis. This is an extremely complex public health issue and beyond, as you all know. We will not be able to cover every aspect of it, but we are really going to dig into a number of topics. But please know between now, the end of the year, and ongoing at the Institute, we continue having these discussions, actions, creating introductions, and opportunities for people to collaborate and partner and move forward together. So if we haven't met already, let's talk afterwards and we can figure something out because we are trying to cover every aspect of this and make sure that we're also helping for people to work together. So with that, we are in a world that is transitioning, as you've heard through our theme of the Global Conference. And this is a public health crisis of historic proportions. We are going to cover policy today. We're going to cover data, communication, and access, stigma, prevention partnerships, and support systems, to name a few. And with me today, to be able to address and cover these topics, I have Admiral Winnefeld, I have uh, Dr. Alan Muni from Cigna, the Chief Medical Officer, I have Dr. Nora Vokal from the National Institute of Drug Abuse, I have the Honorable Greg Walden and Chairman of the Energy and Commerce Committee, Mr. Chairman, and then Dr. Joe Smizer from The Good Project. There are an incredible number of statistics that you all probably have read every day in the news, whether it's the number of deaths reported from the CDC or the, we just talked about this, the half a trillion dollars of economic impact in terms of reported by the White House. Each day it's staggering, the personal stories, everything, and understanding how we got here. And so to get us started with that discussion, we're going to start with Dr. Nora Volkow to say, tell us about this crisis, how did we get here, and what is happening? Well, thanks very much for having me here and, and for the question. I think that the opiate crisis that we're living right now is not something, of course, that occurred overnight. And I would say that, that we have seen it going up over the past two decades. Uh, the, the attention started to come up uh, more noticeably over the past 10 years. What triggered it? I, the event that triggered it was uh, basically the fact that we had a need for treatments of, of uh, pain. And there are 100 million people in the United States that suffer from pain. And so there was a, a very strong push from the healthcare system to actually get physicians and hospitals to screen and treat for, uh, for, for pain mm -hmm. disorders. The problem that we had, this is a very well-intentioned uh, um, initiative, was that, first of all, we did not have uh, many very good alternatives to manage pain, and we became overconfident. And we became overconfident because we had access to pay opioid medications that are very, very good for management of severe acute pain. But when you take an, an opioid, and if you've ever been in a bad crash accident, you'll see that they are almost like miraculous drugs. The pain disappears. But with repeated administration, you require higher and higher doses because you become tolerant. And that becomes a problem when you have chronic pain because you, you actually end up with having extremely high doses that, number one, increase the likelihood that you can become addicted, and number two, actually increase the likelihood that you may have an overdose from respiratory depression as these doses reach a certain level. So we had very good intentions. We did not have many alternatives in terms of management pain, and there was a lot of interest also to get some of these products out there into the market. And you can put fingers here or there. The reality is that we have a system, a healthcare system, that allowed that to happen. At the same time, we, when we became aware that the prescription practices were allowing for diversion of those opioids that then were used by people to actually get high and become addicted, or we were starting to observe that people that were given for pain were becoming addicted, which also was uh, improperly believed when you, that if you had pain, you would not become addicted to the medication. So we have a misunderstanding of that interaction. So we doctors decided, okay, we need to decrease the prescription practices for opioids. 
And so we reduced them, and yet we started to see that the, the overdose fatalities were going up and up and up, and they continue to go up, even though our prescription for opioids is going down. And what's happening is that this epidemic is actually rapidly transitioning. So we started with prescription opioids that allowed for the entry of very pure heroin that then for which there was a market because people were seeking it out and it was less expensive and easier to get than prescription opioids. And then there's a third wave that arrives, which is actually that of synthetic chemistry. The dealers of, uh, of opioids realize that it's much less expensive and easier to smuggle opioids if you synthesize them from scratch as opposed to taking them from the poppy seeds. And then you can generate through chemistry molecules that are so extraordinarily powerful that you require a much smaller volume in order to get the same effect. And that's welcome to fentanyl. And that's what you're actually starting to see, that we've seen um, fatalities that now were barely, we had 200, 300 fatalities of fentanyl seven years ago. We have 20,000 now. And so what we are observing is we go from prescription opioids to heroin to fentanyl. So, Yes, it started with a healthcare system, and that needs to be addressed. Mm -hmm. But I also have to bring it up to all of you that we also now have a much more complex problem that is emerging by the very, very powerful effects of opioids. Opioid medications, or as well as heroin, all of them act by activating the myopioid receptor. And the myopioid receptor stimulates the main reward centers in the brain. It inhibits pain, but it stimulates reward. And that's why it is actually seek out as a drug of abuse, and that's why it can be very, very addictive. And my last point that I do also want to, to, to uh, bring it all up to you, because it bothers me at night, and I, I want to get rid of, of it out of my brain, is the notion, yes, we have a healthcare system that, for whatever reason, allow this to happen. But yet, at the same time, my question to myself is, why? why what was there in America that allowed for the distribution and the the rapid escalation of the abuse of these substances. And as we think about what is it that we can do to prevention, I think we need to address both of those aspects. The role that the healthcare system has played and how do we fix it, but also what is it that we have to do as a nation to prevent an epidemic like this from ever happening again? Because mind you, we don't speak much about it, but if you look now at the fatalities from cocaine, they are going up extremely, extremely rapidly. So we cannot just focus on opioids per se. We need to also address the problem that we have of drugs as a whole in our country. Thank you. Thank you very much. And so hearing the landscape and understanding the complexity and the science of it, which we'll get back to even further, especially when we talk about prevention, Admiral Winnefeld, I know that you've studied this quite a bit and are familiar with it. And from your personal experience and family's experience, what does this crisis mean to you? What, how, what is your take on it? And could sure. you share a little more? Thank you, Sabrina. First, I would say thanks uh, to all of you for being here today. You had a lot of good choices during this hour of this wonderful uh, global gathering. And you chose this one. And I can tell you it means an awful lot to a family that's been through this uh, in a very tragic way to have you here caring enough and curious enough to be here about this today. So thank you. Um, <clears throat> we lost our son, Jonathan, uh, last September. After 15 months of recovery, he was doing really well. He had earned his emergency medical technician qualification. He wanted to help other people who were, had been going through what he was going through. Entered Denver University, and four days later, we lost him. Uh, any of you who have ever been through something like that know that it gives you a constant background noise of sadness in your daily life. But you also know that uh, if, you, if you feel you can do something about it, that you feel you must do something about it. So rather than crawl into a little ball of grief, shame, and anger, which we still do sometimes, um, my wife, Mary, who is here in the room, and I decided to start a nonprofit to try to lend our part, do our part, to reverse this terrible epidemic and to try to prevent uh, another family if possible, from experiencing what we went through. And in true military fashion, analyze the problem, um, uh, both studying addiction very hard and studying the epidemic very hard, two sort of obviously related but different phenomena. We came up with uh, what we believe are, are the, the threads of effort, the lines of operation, whatever you want to call them, that the nation needs to take on in order to reverse this epidemic. And uh, they are very, very closely intertwined. They're very much dependent upon each other, but they're distinct enough that we can program to them in our nonprofit. And they are 
uh, very briefly, uh, public awareness for two reasons, so that we can get more public support, political support, what have you, for uh, re reversing this, but also very, very importantly, and I know we'll talk about this later, uh, eliminating the stigma that is associated with the disease of addiction. The second line is prevention, full spectrum prevention across of, uh, schools, colleges, uh, workplaces, what have you, along a whole array of, of mechanisms for uh, prevention. The third, of course, being prescription medicine, which is not only a phenomena of some very irresponsible sectors of the pharmaceutical industry, but also uh, doctors and dentists. I have not spoken to a person in the last several months who has had a major medical procedure or an injury that has gotten a verbal warning from a physician or a dentist, which is appalling to me. It's about having smart consumers. It's about having take-back programs. But there's a whole huge niche of the pharmaceutical and, uh, and the prescription medicine piece that we've got to get our arms around. The fourth one is uh, we, we tied together law enforcement and medical response, partly because six lines of effort are better than seven. <clears throat> but they are very closely interrelated. And they range from things like warm handoff from an overdose into uh, uh, medically assisted treatment, that sort of thing. It includes protecting our first responders. It also includes wise law enforcement and justice uh, efforts that uh, acknowledge the fact that 85% of the people in this country who are arrested for a drug crime are only arrested for possession. And that's no way to get yourself out of this crisis. We need to be smarter there. The fourth line of operation um, is uh, treatment and recovery. We believe that there's simply not enough high quality affordable, accessible uh, treatment uh, for addiction in this country. Uh, and uh, so we believe very strongly that that needs to be worked. And then, of course, um, there is uh, what we call family support and outreach. And that falls squarely into the mode of if we had only knew then what we know now, we would still have our son with us. Because there are some very simple things that you must do, especially when somebody is transiting out of inpatient treatment and back into society, that if you don't get those right, it's the most dangerous time for somebody in uh, recovery. And then last, we have sort of two cross-cutting uh, things we believe in. Uh, one is that this will be resolved not only at the federal and state level, but most importantly at the community level. So safe communities is something that we're work, working very hard on. And then safe campuses as well. There's an amazingly broad spectrum among college campuses in this country for who the best practices are for helping their students in recovery and which campuses are doing sort of absolutely nothing. And we sort of tried to capture all of this mm -hmm. in, in a theme that is not just say no, N-O, but is more just say K-N-O-W, because the only way we're going to get ourselves out of this is if the American people are educated into the real nuances of it. And as many of you know from your business lives and your daily lives, when you get one inch deep into a highly complex problem, as you described it, it's really easy to lunge for simplistic and, in, fra in fact, dangerous solutions. So, we are hoping to raise the general level of knowledge so that we can get to the right kinds of solutions here. Yeah, thank you. And with that, to the point of complexity, there's a comprehensive plan you have. Mm -hmm. So comprehensive approach with a plan. Right. And through that complexity, we also have a comprehensive effort that Mr. Chairman will walk us through in terms of policy. You've been advancing a lot of legislation in response to this opioid crisis. And could you share a little bit about where are we? And, sure. and what's going on right now. And we'll dig into these other topics that the Admiral brought up as yeah, well. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Sabrina. And uh, Admiral, thank you, and, and Nora as well, for sharing your stories and kind of setting the stage. And Mary, thank you. She participated in a, a victims panel we had a week ago Thursday in Washington, and it was very, very powerful and meaningful. And I'm sorry for your loss. Um, and I, I think the Admiral said it well. This, you get into this issue, and it's our top priority on the Energy and Commerce Committee in the U.S. House. To, to examine what went wrong, how did we get here? So our oversight and investigation subcommittee has been working for more than a year doing the deep dive investigative look, work, uh, specifically focused on West Virginia. It's kind of the epicenter of the country, and you can really peel back the onion there, and you can find uh, situations where uh, millions of hydrocodone pills dropped into tiny little towns. Kermit, West Virginia has a population of 406 people. In a two-year period, nine million pills Nine million hydrocodone pills went in there. Williamson, West Virginia, 2,900 people. 20.8 million pills over 10 years. Mount Gay, Shamrock, 1,779 people. 16.5 million people over that same 10-year period. Between 2007 and 2012, 780 million hydrocodone and oxycodone pills went into West Virginia. 
how does this happen? And they aren't unique, but they are. And people, a colleague of mine from there, uh, David McKinley says, people will go, well, that's West Virginia, depressed economy, coal, poor, whatever. Then how come New Hampshire is second to West Virginia? See, this cuts across all socioeconomic lines. It doesn't check your voter registration card, your age, anything. It is, it is across the spectrum, which is why we're, while we're sitting here, five people will die from overdose of hydrocodone or other opioids. So we are looking at the Energy and Commerce Committee, what went wrong, what do we need to investigate, how did we get there, and on May 8th, we'll have the CEOs from the major distributors before the Oversight and Investigations Committee were to that point in the investigation say, okay, how did all these pills go in here? What do we need to change? We've had the DEA a couple of times, and in fact, we've threatened subpoenas the DEA to get information out of them as we do our investigation. So that's that part. The other part is what you referenced, which is the public policy piece. In October, we had a Members Day, we called it, where any member of Congress could come and present their ideas, and it spanned the spectrum from as conservative as you get to as liberal as you get. And out of that emerged uh, more than 60 different pieces of legislation. And we had, we've had hearings after that uh, looking at these ideas and these prescriptions to move forward in sort of three tranches. One is what do we need to do on enforcement? So how do we stop the synthetic fentanyls from coming in, the synthetic opioids from coming in? So we actually have legislation addressing some of that. Tragically, a lot of them come in through our U.S. postal facilities. Uh, because we lack the, uh, the, the, the people and, and, and talent and all to go in and scan and, and remove these packages. Um, and we're, we're focused on that. And, and there are other things. You talk about the chemistry changes. They change a molecule and then all of a sudden you have a new synthetic opioid. By the way, they can do that faster than the law has been able to keep up. And so what we find is with those synthetic opioids, they're not illegal for a time. And so they just keep changing it. So we're trying to change the law to stay ahead of them or get ahead of them. Now we have to be careful about that because guess what? Medical research also changes. So you don't want to make medical research illegal. So it gets to your point, Admiral, about doing something real quick and easy. You have to be careful and thoughtful. So we're doing that and so we have an enforcement piece. And then I think culturally we have, we're getting closer to accepting the fact that addiction is not necessarily a crime. It is a disease and we need to help people through that. So our second tranche really dealt is dealing with how do you help people in addiction? How do you have, uh, take a look at the federal system. What do we need to change in the law to move forward with medically assisted? How do you, how do you deal with oversight over pain clinics and all that lack it today where there's fraud? We heard in the, in the parents and the victims panel, parents who sent their children to uh, pain clinics in Florida, frankly, um, and it got worse, not better, and, 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 the, and the child died. And so we're looking at how do we deal with addiction? How do we share information? We have situations where parents have said um, our, our child was clean and sober and then had some other medical treatment. The next medical provider was not informed because of certain uh, information sharing restrictions and got prescribed opioids and died. And so, I mean, we're trying to break down these barriers, these silos that are actually leading to death and destruction as opposed to recovery. And, and then the third piece is there's a disproportionate share of funding for these efforts through Medicaid and Medicare. And those programs are sort of anchored in the past. And so we're looking at how do you evolve the changes there to take advantage of telemedicine, expand uh, prescribing uh, for Suboxone and other things. So it's, we, had, we marked up 56 bills, we got four to go. Yeah, and then you mentioned something in terms of why wanting to be very thorough, you also have a sense of urgency and leading a team right. on both sides who's looking at everything to be able to move it forward together. That's right. Be to your point that it impacts everybody, no matter where they live, no matter how old they are, no matter what we look like or where we come from, everybody knows someone and that we have to get more solutions out there, more resources and be more informed with that. And in terms of our theme of collaboration, comprehensive approaches, Dr. Muni, I know that Cigna has been responding and evolving to have a mind body, a comprehensive approach that meets our communities where they are uh, and to be sensitive to that and to involve different stakeholders. Could you talk more about your, your platform and, and what's happening and how you do it? Sure, thanks Sabrina. So um, we tried to take a practical approach, um, meaning with our physicians and with our um, customers um, that we have at Cigna. So, 
about two and a half years ago, we brought together our resources across our behavioral, medical, and pharmacy uh, programs uh, with the intent to identify how could we work with our physician partnership models uh, to interrupt the cycle of uh, addiction and to really change the view to what can we do to recognize uh, that substance abuse is a complex, chronic condition um, that's often complicated by other behavioral and medical conditions. So we took our approach, uh, which is um, trying to manage the whole person, uh, and uh, took that uh, to what can we do in the whole person as applied to managing substance abuse as a chronic uh, uh, illness. Because when you change the conversation from thinking about uh, <laughs> substance abuse and misuse as in a silo, and addiction is in a silo, the conversations change with physicians to what is the holistic standard of care for taking care of this issue as a chronic illness. The conversation changes with our case managers in terms of how they engage uh, with our patients. For example, we train them to meet uh, the patient where they are. So they may call a patient that has diabetes or back pain and say, how you doing today? And the answer to that question could be, you know, I'm feeling depressed. They go to the depression, they work those issues, and, and then they try to get back to the purpose of the call. So we think this holistic approach um, has helped us get to where we've been able to reduce opioid prescriptions across our uh, physicians uh, by 25% uh, as of uh, last year, but it is complicated, uh, and I'm going to get to those um, uh, those issues. So, in addition to taking that holistic approach, the practical things we did were uh, we um, collaborated with uh, lots of physicians, uh, dentists, and local community uh, leaders to look at how we could uh, deploy better safeguards in terms of prescribing, how we could increase uh, access, how we could increase local counseling supports in the community. We um, uh, convened over 2,000 uh, medical groups, over 65,000 plus physicians, all of whom signed pledges to reduce their opioid prescriptions as well as to view substance abuse as a, a chronic uh, illness. We um, uh, engaged um, uh, our analytics in terms of trying to help identify who we thought was at risk of abuse uh, and um, misuse of, um, of uh, drugs. Um, we opened our counseling line to all veterans and their families, regardless of whether they were Cigna customers or not, because of, of really the dreadful impact on, on veterans uh, uh, specifically. Um, we um, engaged uh, physicians, over 85,000 of them annually, around data that showed uh, their, their patients were misusing uh, drugs. Um, we sent alerts based on data and our enhanced predictive analytics, which looked at who was at highest risk for potential overdose. And in order to support all those physician interactions, we enhanced our uh, case manager uh, support uh, to deploy uh, that against um, uh, you know the the uh, interventions that had to occur, but as was already mentioned, um, prevention at the individual consumer level. We thought we had the opportunity, uh, and we created a prevention uh, program that interacted with our consumers who had pain, teaching them about <coughs> pain, how pain can be managed and importantly, how to have discussions with their physicians about opioids. We also worked with our employer uh, groups who we uh, knew had substance abuse uh, issues in, in particular in terms of opioid management programs that we worked with the employers uh, to, to actually get out um, into their uh, uh, populations. Um, and, um, uh, you know, in, in the end, um, uh, 
as has been alluded to on the panel, you know, we do all of these really good concrete things that we were hoping that could make an impact. Um, and also, we had advocacy positions at the national level that we thought were important. So working with um, uh, uh, Chairman Walden and some of uh, people on his committee about the fact that if we're trying to tell physicians to treat uh, substance abuse as a chronic illness, the laws do not support collaboration across physicians because substance uh, abuse data and treatment is in one silo and doctors treating uh, patients uh, uh, for something else have no idea uh, what's gone on. So it isn't until we can bring that together that I think that will be a giant uh, a step forward um, to getting to that holistic approach. The other advocacy positions we are, to, and very practical one, is how do we make uh, naloxone or Narcan, which is the uh, uh, short-acting antidote to an overdose, make it more available in the communities. So one idea w that we're working on is wherever there is an AED, we want to deploy Narcan because, mm -hmm. frankly, it's the same thing. It's, it's uh, deploy it and call 911. And we think that would get it out in the communities. But there are other places you don't think of. And this is a true story happened less than two weeks ago. A Cigna colleague of mine who is not a physician was on a flight. Um, a patient got sick, turned blue, stopped breathing. The doctor on board recognized that it was an opioid overdose and um, had the flight attendant announce, does anybody on board have Narcan? Well, when I heard that, I went, whoa. I mean, the chance of anybody on board mm -hmm. having Narcan is like, you know, lightning striking you after you hit a hole in one. And, uh, and yet, my Cigna colleague had taken it upon himself last year to take a local course in Connecticut uh, where he lived about how to administer Narcan. And when he graduated from that course, they gave him a vial, and it was actually in his briefcase. Wow. He walked it back to the doctor. It was administered. Patient was revived. Plane was able to land in 20 minutes, and paramedics um, met them. So, so while that's great, the question you have to ask is, why don't all, all airlines carry Narcan at this point as an emergency, you know, piece of emergency medical equipment. Maybe that's something, you know, you could look into, uh, uh, Chairman. But, um, you know, so it, it, the complexity of this doesn't end. And to get back to where Dr. Volk started the conversation, as, as happy as we are that we were able to reduce the opioid uh, prescriptions, um, you know, across our population, um, we measured last year that despite that, we had a 19% increase in overdoses. Mm. And out of that overdose population, only 40% of them actually had a prescription for an opioid in our system. So this is why we're here today. This is a complex problem that yep. you can do all the great things, uh, but we've got to make these uh, connections uh, from across multiple disciplines in order to make a difference. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that story as well. We will come back to that piece. And I, I want to go to you, Dr. Smizer. Your company is known for big data, but taking from a tech perspective and media in the context of public health, how does that work with your collaborative model? based off of the crisis. If you could just explain that landscape so then we could dig in a little bit further as we transition through this panel. Sure. Um, well, so we're, at, we're a nonprofit, I should, I should say. Um, and we were formed a few years ago uh, by executives from industry and then executives from public health and healthcare. And it was uh, basically out of a mutual frustration that public health as a field was lagging years behind, and I think maybe you could argue in some cases decades behind, um, and I'm a public health person, so I can say that, um, industry. And, uh, and we wanted to deploy some of the lessons that, um, that industry and some of the tech that industry has access to for public health and healthcare. Um, so fast forward, um, we're now really deep into the big data space, um, like everybody. Um, it's, we're talking a lot about it at, at this conference, actually. How do you leverage big data and new technology for business decisions, primarily? Um, we're in that same space, but we use that for uh, public health and healthcare. So what that means for us is 
We have partnerships with uh, tech firms that you would expect, the social media companies and Google, um, but also with large healthcare systems like Kaiser Permanente and Trinity Health and Dignity Health. Um, and big data to us just means mostly data that comes from media. Um, so traditional media like radio and television um, and print news and then you know new media like, like social media. Um, and how that actually works for us is we have half our staff are public health people um, and half our staff are data analysts and they sit at the same table and they do a formal literature review to find any public health or clinical research that exists on, our, on the topic that we're faced with. In this case, it would be the opioid epidemic. And then we operationalize that into how can we basically make search queries in this big data that's coming in through media. So just like you would in a Google search bar type in something to give you a result, that's essentially what we're doing. We're just doing it with a, a lot of data and it's all coming from publicly available uh, media sources. Um, and then sometimes we go to the tech companies themselves. Like for instance, we worked on a research program around the opioid epidemic with Facebook and we worked on a research program around this epidemic with Google. So if we don't have access to the data ourselves, they sometimes give us um, access to their data analyst who has access to their data. Um, and that's, uh, that's basically, in a, in a nutshell, how, how we work, and I'll share a little bit later what we found. Great, thank you for that. And I can I Please. comment on the issue of the data because that is actually something that is uh, crucial for this epidemic to start with. For example, we even don't know right now, we don't have sufficient data to understand for the overdoses, a very simple one. What percentage of them relate to patients that had pain versus what percentage of them were patients that actually were using it in order to, because they were abusing the drug. So we don't, and, and your intervention is going to be very different if you have pain than if you actually have become addicted to the drug. The other thing is the, the epidemic is extraordinary heterogeneous throughout the United States. So for example, Massachusetts has one of the lowest rates of opioid prescription practices in the country, and yet it has got one of the highest mortality from overdoses. 80% of its overdose fatalities are from fentanyl, yep. whereas in Arkansas and Oklahoma, basically most of the mortality there is from prescription opioids. But without having a good understanding of the data, you cannot tailor interventions. And the other aspect about it that is very important, for which you also need data, we've all come to recognition that yes, we have treatments for, for uh, opioid addiction. They are not being deployed, and that is a, an issue that we're working on to try to expand access to, um, to places where individuals can get treated right away, but importantly, with quality of care. Mm -hmm. And that's where the data needs to come in. Because right now, there are all of these treatment programs that are proliferating from the United States and taking advantage of desperate people mm -hmm. that, need, that need someone to That's take right. care of them. And there's no quality in, in, right. in addiction. You are going to have a heart surgery, you go into a web and determine which hospital has the best outcomes. We should be doing that for treatment outcomes. And, so, and use that in order to also incentivize the treatment programs to have better standards. I think that the whole aspect about data is one that deserves a focus attention. Th thank you for that. Please, Dr. Moon, no, you? No. Oh, okay. You. Speaking of data, we've also talked in the past at the Future Health Summit that we had last fall about the importance of data sharing as well to have the, there's a lot of dashboards that are out there as well. But there's a, a piece, Dr. Nor uh, Volkow, that you uh, wrote in the New England Journal of Medicine recently, I think it was April 26th, where uh, data tells a story, but the context is really important. And so it was focused on the silent, another silent killer. And so not to add more complexity to the, the opioid crisis, but you spoke about unintentional and intentional deaths and the importance of screening for depression. Could you talk a little bit further about that piece? Uh, yeah, this is uh, something else uh, why we actually don't have good data. And it's the notion of we are um, basically recording fatalities from opioid overdoses. But um, studies that have been done on relatively r smaller samples have identified that those cases that are being actually recorded at overdoses may in fact reflect suicidal behavior. And suicidal behavior has two components. The component that I said, I don't want to live anymore. I'm going to take a very high dose of opioids so I can die. But what drugs do is not just they erode your capacity for self-control, 
but they erode what the French call la joie de vivre. And I don't know how do you say it in English, but it's the joy, the joy of living. Yeah. Yeah. And so it is, I mean, I hear too frequently um, when someone says, well, I, I, I take the drug and I, I, I sort of hope I wouldn't wake up. So, so that loss, that's more passive type of where you're willing to go and do ha a more risky behavior. And we need to actually identify it as such. And we're not doing it. And why do we need to identify it as such? Is because your therapeutic intervention, when someone comes with an overdose, you have the obligation to have a treatment plan. If there is a history of suicidal behavior, you need to address it. If there is a history of addiction, you need to provide the treatment for that individual. And the healthcare system should be made accountable for that. And we should be able to monitor that. And then if you have a patient that has pain, and this is unbelievable, but it is what's happening in our country. And overdoses, because the doses were too large, there has to be a system that the treating physician knows that that happened to that patient so that they can bring the doses down. And mm -hmm. that is not being communicated. So it's suicide <coughs> as one of the factors that is contributing to the overdoses, but it's more than that. It's leading us to recognize that we don't completely understand the heterogeneity of the causes that are resulting in overdoses. Thank you. Yeah, and I want to just come back to the depression aspect. You know, screening for depression, um, I can tell you with all our case manager calls, is, is paramount because um, that in itself with a lot of patients is a stigma and you have to draw out that discussion and it is extremely relevant to not only your success in managing the condition overall whatever it is but also managing the risk with the easy access for those who actually may be in the suicidal uh, category so the whole issue of stigma um, I, I think is something that has to be um, addressed. Um, uh, in, in fact, identified uh, by the physicians we worked with, we came up with um, principles of care, including uh, principles to remove stigma uh, when you are treating the whole uh, uh, patient. And um, even among physicians, uh, they immediately are aware of it, but they all have their own prejudices of how they've thought about this. And a lot of it is because of they were forced to think about it in a silo yeah. and not treating the whole patient. Thank you for bringing that up. Because in the context of communication and access, stigma, Joe, I, I'd, like to, I'd like you to share some examples of how your model and work in terms of the public health, public health and the opioid crisis is uncovering some findings that could lead us to maybe changing the way we communicate and our actions forward. And so just share a little bit more so we could discuss that a little bit. Well, we think a lot about health communication. So maybe the science is really rigorous. Maybe the public health and the healthcare community, there's agreement there about uh, where we're at and what we need to know and what we don't know. Um, but then, so as very often is the case, there's a big gap between public health and healthcare subject matter experts and the public. And that's certainly true with the opioid epidemic. Um, people don't know what opioids are. That's really, really clear if you look at the data. Um, but consistently, we see policymakers and uh, public health subject matter experts use the word opioids instead of painkillers, which is what people actually say. Um, we also see real big differences in um, how in the messaging that people are exposed to in rural areas versus urban areas in the United States. So rural communities have a very different conceptualization of the opioid epidemic than, um, than urban communities do. And there's very little messaging, very little health communication that's being tailored for rural populations. Um, mostly it's being ta tailored for urban populations. Um, we worked uh, really closely with some, some of the tech companies and we found if you look at the, the data, it's pretty clear um, 18 to 25 year olds in the United States have been reached not at all um, by any sort of prevention messaging. They're not talking about it. They're not reading anything about it. Um, they're not sharing any of that information. They're not opening up any news stories on the opioid epidemic. Um, and that's really important because that's when a lot of people start taking opioids is in their, is in their 20s and then there's a transition that happens. Um, folks over the age of 45 years old and older do pay attention to the opioid epidemic, 
um, but they're looking at it through a lens of that's often related to chronic pain. So they have some personal experience with chronic pain, which younger audiences typically don't. And then there's a policy framing, so uh, which younger audiences tend not to care so much about. Um, so if we don't tailor the communication for the different audiences, then we're we're going to come across as tone deaf, um, and that's that's a huge issue right, right now that, that I see in the in sort of the in sort of the response. If you look at messages that are transmitted to the public, the opioid epidemic is framed predominantly as a policy debate that's occurring in Washington D.C., and that's incredibly disempowering for individuals who are living through the opioid epidemic. There's almost no information about what local communities are doing or handling. Uh, this topic, what people are doing for themselves, local heroes. Um, that, there's almost nothing out there that, that's like that. And that's particularly true in rural areas, which we know are um, over-indexed on opioid uh, overdoses. Um, and Google did its own study uh, with us and found that that's, that's true if you just look at Google searches. So Google searches related to opioids um, are heavier in counties that have higher um, overdose rates for opioids. Um, there's a, the trend lines are overlapping. Um, and it's predictable, the information that people need and the progression of someone who is experiencing um, pain or a reason that people start taking opioids and their progression from I'm, I maybe have been in a car accident or I'm taking certain drugs recreationally that we know um, are correlated with opioid <laughs> use. And that path of the person from that moment to um, getting prescribed an opioid or using an opioid to um, looking, looking up symptoms of opioids because now they're taking them mm -hmm. to becoming dependent to becoming addicted to now looking for treatment. Mm -hmm. And that is um, consistent across the United States and it's uh, really clear and if we could just get messaging to those people in the moments when they need the messaging, um, we could do a tremendous amount to, to curb this. Um, but again, we, then the messaging needs to reflect where that person's at and their lived experience and their cultural and social norms. Um, I would just, I would add yeah. very briefly because no, I know you're the topic you want to get onto is that this you know, we, are, we are studying this problem literally to death. Um, and it's you know the kind of work that's being done on, in the medical community and the academic community is really important to us. Uh, and the things that Joe is talking about uh, really speak to, okay, um, we got a think tank. Let's do a do tank, um, and let's start uh, taking, capitalizing on what they're learning, and get it out on the ground. That's right. And do these things exactly that have to right. be done. We're planning. Continue on studying, that. please. But yeah. let's do, please. So, I'm, I'm glad that you brought that up because we that is part of our follow-up from here. We have quite a bit. Uh, we have some people in the audience, too, that are part of that follow-up and those intersections, including you and, and Mary, uh, because it does take that collaborative effort, taking that insight and then being able to reach into what you said even early on uh, in the schools. And, and I, I, Laura, yeah, no, and I want to say uh, something because, I mean, just by sitting here, I mean, I think something has being brought up that is, is, is clear that identifies a major gap. We've done a lot of effort towards the prevention of drug use among children and adolescents. There's a major gap on the transition from high school into college when you're actually going to be on your own. And that's where we see that the uptake of opioids happening. So the need to actually identify that as an, an, an extremely important area of further research. But I also believe that it is, ex again, we need to also hear from the patients and the families. And this is something that in all of this dialogue, we hadn't done in the past. And last week, for the first time, the Food and Drug Administration, in partnership with the NIH and the Addiction Policy Forum, brought patients into a government building to listen from them and from the families what were their needs, as opposed to us up there, in there in these clouds, yeah. to actually start to establish a dialogue about what are the needs out there in the community and how we can then, based on that, develop research programs. Research, and then also I know Chairman, Mr. Chairman, you, uh, you've you been yeah. doing a lot of listening as yeah, well. Yeah, I'm, I'm not alone on that. I, I think there's much more being done on the ground than, than people may realize with, with members. I've probably done half a dozen or more roundtables with patients, people in addiction, parents, uh, addiction providers, or uh, 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 treatment providers, um, uh, law enforcement, and let me tell you just one story. I, I did one of these in Medford, Oregon about three years ago now, and I knew who was around the table because I had invited them to tell me what's happening here on the ground, and there was a fellow sitting against the wall. When we were done, I said, so what brings you here, sir? 
He said my son was a high school athlete. He got injured. He got addicted on opioids. And now we're dealing with his heroin addiction. And he said, then there's my sister who was a, a, a nurse and became addicted to opioids, began stealing a prescription pad, writing her own prescription. She got fired, went to another town, repeat, got rehired, did the same thing and died of an overdose. And this is going on in community after community after community. Now, I would say we are making progress when you think about National Take Back Day was Saturday. Uh, in, in my district, we did a lot of promotion on that. I went to a take back site. In Oregon, they took back uh, the prior year. I haven't heard what happened Saturday yet, but over five tons of medicines, yeah. five tons. Washington State uh, last year took back over seven tons of medicines. Now, they aren't all opioids, but when I was standing there, this woman brought up a garbage bag full of medicines dropped them in the box, no questions asked. What we have to get to, and we've got legislation that works on that, is a very simple system that if you're from the, 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 the West Coast out here, we're used to recycling our bottles and cans and taking them back and getting your dime back or whatever. We do it with ink cartridges at Staples. We need to be able to have a simple, safe, you don't even think twice about system for returning medicines that are unused. And there's One of the things, if I could... Uh, it's an interesting metric. The Wisconsin Attorney General told me recently they took 63,000 pounds of uh, opiates back last year. 63,000 pounds. That's 30 tons. Yeah. And I think that's the wrong metric. Yeah. If we weigh this stuff, that's one thing. You all are business people. You understand metrics. What's the economic value of those things? How much did oh, we pay? Absolutely. How much did insurance companies pay? Hey, How much did consumers yeah. pay for yeah. those drugs from pharmaceutical are companies are that yeah. are being thrown away? Yeah. But I, I think the important piece yeah. to get to an earlier statement this is a comprehensive strategy. Take back one piece one to get piece it out of the medicine yeah. cabinets rather than in a punch bowl yeah. at a college dorm. Yeah. You know, you and, know and, and so we, we have to get to best practices on prescribing to reduce that. We have to change the culture. We've got to make sure that we're doing every piece of this along the continuum. Yeah. Take but but let me then put you on the spot because I think one of the things that I've been, I get these emails and they say, yeah, you're, you're all saying that we should be following the CDC guidelines, that opioid prescription should not be the first line of treatment right. for someone in chronic pain, but then we're not being reimbursed. So the, it is much less. It's We're much changing easier. the reimbursement strategies so, too in the legislation, and, and that needs to be addressed. Mm -hmm. And the same thing needs to be addressed because actually you need a multi-pronged, multi-comprehensive management of pain. That's number one. Right. And the other one, we need to ensure that the treatment uh, and is sustained as a chronic disease. Uh, is covered for the management of opioid use disorders. Right. And we're actually, we have, among the 63 bills we're looking at, we have bills that address all those issues. And there's, sure. a, there's also the point where um, uh, prescriptions aren't correlated, re prescription writing and right. patients getting prescriptions are not correlated from state to state, so right. people can move around, PDMPs. which is the right. same issue uh, years ago that we had when a doctor would lose his or her license and could move mm -hmm. just from state to state until the National Practitioner Data Bank was put into place. So this is a similar So we're issue. also, we have legislation on PDMPs, yep. we have legislation on e-prescribing, we have legislation to allow uh, pharmacists to decline mm -hmm. to fill when they think there's a problem. Um, and so I mean, the, yep. again, we, we, the good news for me on, on the committee I chair, we have doctors, we have fit, uh, pharmacists, we have people that have been involved in a lot of these areas, yeah. plus a lot of us have gone out and right. done these on the ground. And with that, with the policy, then how we bring it back to our communities, right? So when it hits our communities, how are we communicating with them? And I'd like to go back to stigma to spend a little bit more time on that and talk through how do we remove the barriers? Like how are we talking, how are we getting to our communities, not after something happens, before something happens? What more can we do? What can we do differently? Or, and how are we thinking right. of all this? And, and not just led, through the, even just the dialogue, yeah. through the prevention efforts. I, I think there's some interesting things happening. I, I was in Illinois with uh, Adam Kinzinger, a, a member of Congress, a colleague on the committee. And he had a round table where the sheriff's office in, and I've forgotten which town it was, they now, you come in, uh, whether you're a heroin addict or, or opioid addicted, you turn in your medicines there, you turn in the drugs there, no questions asked, and they guarantee within 24 hours you'll be in treatment. Now you think about the sea change, you talk about a world in transition. Yeah. You take your heroin into the sheriff's office and say, I'm here, take it. And, and, and so we have to get to a culture that, that is similar to that, where we recognize this is, addiction is a disease and a disorder that needs treatment. 
and, and yeah. I and agree. And the same right. thing in New Hampshire, in Manchester, for example, they started the fire department. If you are addicted, you go there and they take you. They physically take you to a treatment program there right there, go. and they will guarantee they'll treat you. So we're changing the way that we do practices. But I think that the other that the other element is very very relevant in all of this is that as we're addressing uh, stigma is me as a physician, one of the, the aspects that I realize is that the moment that we can give greater tools to the healthcare system uh, for them to be able to manage addiction like they manage any other diseases, right. it would automatically be embraced. So it's not a theoretical component. So one of the aspects that we give priority in research is the development of therapeutics and evidence-based interventions such that uh, then we can, and, and funding models that can be used in the medical, in the medical setting. For example, we're funding several researchers to initiate treatment uh, for an opioid use disorder in the emergency department. Mm -hmm. Right there when the patient is captive, right. as opposed to what's happening, that the patient are released after an overdose. And then of course they go and immediately overdose right. and un unfortunately many times they, they die. 10%, hear about this number because it makes me mad. 10% of patients that end up in an emergency room uh, with an overdose will be dead in one year. Mm -hmm. And they were in the emergency department. So I think that when we're this issue of policy, I think that I'm going to be shot down because, I mean, what to me is can we demand that there is reimbursement on the basis of ensuring that there is quality care? Because to me, it is malpractice to take someone from an overdose and release them with no uh, very specific treatment. A thousand people a day will show up in that ER overdose. Yeah. And a couple of interesting dimensions of stigma. Um, first of all, uh, it is more of an older person's problem than a younger person's problem. I have a very good friend, very wealthy man, read our uh, article in The Atlantic, uh, gave it to his son because he thought something was weird with his son. The very next day, son comes in and says, this is me, I need help. And uh, what we found was that the the father, the mother, the, the, the older people in the family were like, we want to keep this quiet, but we need your help finding treatment. And so we vectored them into treatment. I've got this, the son is, is uh, I, I can't really say too much about him because I'm respectful of the privacy of the family, but the son is like, I don't, I'm happy to go out on a speaking tour if you want. Uh, I'll work for you guys, I'll do whatever you want. So the younger generation, millennials, post-millennials, are, are more okay with this than the older generation, which is why people like Mary and me stood up and said, you know, this is us, you know, trying to set an example. The other thing is um, there are some other gradients too. We just found out yesterday about this really great little treatment center in Denver uh, because there are so many young women who have kids who are in right. this situation. And if you're a mom and you are thinking of, you know, I need treatment and you go in there, you're worried they're going to take your kids away, right? Yeah. So they will take in a, a young woman, they will give her the treatment and the kid gets to go with her. And they, they take very good care of the whole family entity there including the, the child and mother. So, so making pathways where people feel more comfortable in admitting their addiction uh, is, I think, a very important dimension of this. And I'm glad that you brought that up in terms of the generations. One, there's a future discussion this afternoon about that, how younger generations are changing the dialogue. But if our younger generations are also the ones that need support, it's also the reaction to that and making sure that infrastructure is there in terms of listening and responding versus <laughs> reacting in a certain way. Right. And so for you to be out front yeah. makes a difference for sure. other people to hear that. Yeah, oh, yeah and it's also um, what came through uh, with our work with physicians. Um, it, it's really about the words we use also. Um, using words like addict or clean and dirty versus, you know, this is a chronic illness, you know, that really changes attitudes um, where it may be somebody doesn't get the follow-up they, they need out of that emergency because they're just an addict as opposed to there's somebody with a chronic illness and mm -hmm. more compassion and problems. So, you know, down to basics like that, it really changes the conversations and I think changes the attitude. Yeah, and support systems yeah. we've talked about mm -hmm. and transitions, right, right. and what's there mm -hmm. transitions. Sure. I know that you and Mary have spoken about that quite a bit as well. Sure, and there's another pathway into, you know, we see three pathways into opioid addiction. One is the sort of um, over-prescribed physical injury pathway. Mm -hmm. Another is uh, the party pathway. Uh, and the third is the uh, comorbidity mental health pathway. Mm -hmm. And there is an increasing trend in our, in our country of young kids being diagnosed with um, attention deficit and being prescribed Adderall. It's the same phenomenon that the prescription 
uh, medicine companies did to push opioids, they're pushing Adderall now. And that, that's what happened to our son. He was misdiagnosed as being ADD. Uh, he was actually, he had anxiety, and Adderall is the worst thing you can do for somebody with anxiety. But imagine telling a young kid, four, five, six years old, you know, you're not normal. You need this thing every day to make you normal. That is the beginning of stigma that will cement itself deeply in that young child's brain and, and will feed into opioid sti uh, stigma when they get older. So we've just got to be a little more reasonable, I think, about um, what we're doing with our young children. And I'll tell you, if you've got a kid and he's, he or she is uh, diagnosed with uh, ADD, get a second opinion. Thank you for that. I know that we have a few moments left. I would like to just cover prevention and your take on prevention and your guidance around prevention and the sense of urgency uh, from through the different lenses because through our discussions leading up to this we've all talked about that and then some closing remarks in terms of what you want everyone to leave here knowing or be able to do whether it's proper disposal at home or take back days there's you're all experts in, from a different perspective but you're also individuals you're part of a family you're part of communities and there's something that we all can do and so I'd like you to hear from this panel of experts too to the end so let's okay. talk about prevention first and then get to some tips ideas so we all have action leaving this room and we are not just a think tank at the sure. Milk Institute we are an action Appreciate tank that. we will have all of you walk through the door with us so for the record okay I wasn't accusing you. No, I know. I just wanted to take uh, that opportunity just, to drive it home that we are an action yeah. tank as well. But that really, is the, that really is the core of my message, which I'll get to in one second. Uh, uh, I, uh, I do think on the prevention side, uh, it's, it's about effective communications. And, and communications is about messages, messengers, mediums, timing, and audiences. And if you can take all five of those into account when you're trying to get a prevention message out to a particular audience, whether it's a high school varsity baseball team, which I've spent a lot of time working with, or whether it's a workforce in a union, or what have you, if you can get the right credible voices with the right messages, and it takes some experimentation to get that right, uh, and do the timing right and all that sort of stuff, I think we've got a fighting chance to get this, uh, this stigma message out there and the prevention message when they're all very intertwined. And on the um, message takeaway, I would just say, please recognize that this is an incredibly complex uh, epidemic. And each of those lines of operation that I described are interdependent on each other. If we don't reduce stigma, we won't get people into treatment. If we take care of the prescription drug medicine problem without taking care of the on-the-street heroin problem, our son bought heroin in an open-air heroin market in Denver, then we won't solve that problem. They're all inex inextricably intertwined. And recognize that in addition to all the great work that people like uh, Chairman Walner are doing on the Hill, that state governors and governments are doing, this is, in the end, a community problem. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, that's what we're all about. Uh, there are a lot of organizations, not just ours. It's a public-private problem. If you have a philanthropic bent, please help us or help somebody else who's working this problem on the ground. doesn't matter. Uh, but get involved if you can, because you can really make a difference. Thank you. And if you need ways and ideas, reach out to us. We'll help with that. Okay. Or come follow your organization, Dr. Muni. Any remarks from prevention and closure? Sure. So, so I think um, I go back to the um, inability today to um, merge treatment plans um, and and the data. Um, uh, really, so you can't treat holistically. Um, that uh, is really um, is a missed opportunity on prevention, and it also fosters the continuation of the stigma. Um, that's attached uh, as well until we start bringing those things together. Thank you. Dr. Volkow. Yeah, I'm fr in, 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 from the medical perspective, we know that the most important intervention by far we can do is to prevent a disease. And in the case of addiction, the thing that's so much more challenging is you can completely prevent it. And if there are no drugs, the person does not become addicted. So what is it that we can do in order to actually minimize the likelihood that uh, uh, individuals start to experiment to drugs and then become addicted and I think it is a very doable one and that's why I started by asking my always ask my question what is it that we're doing as a country that has allowed for the opioid crisis to actually blaze like such a wildfire and I think we have to ask that question and uh, and brings back to the point that what we know from prevention families are extraordinarily important as a first line of defense but as importantly also are the communities. And we need to look at what is it that we have done 
in the communities throughout the United States that had led to a level of degradation that is not providing that support that is necessary. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, I think it gets back to uh, what the doctor said. It all starts with a prescription, generally, until it's out there in the medicine cabinets and then flowing out into the streets, unless it's the fentanyls, which we have to stop, the synthetics. Um, so it gets back to changing behaviors. I was with an oncologist the other day who said he was old enough to remember in his continuing education, they said it was malpractice not to prevent pain in the patients. Mm -hmm. Now it's malpractice to, pre to prevent pain mm -hmm. in the patients in effect. And there are national studies at the VA and one in Europe that shows using uh, traditional over-the-counter uh, anti-inflammatories and painkillers like Tylenol or something, in the end, the patients reported less pain that were on those than on opioids. Now, that doesn't mean you don't need opioids, and I'm not pretending to play a doctor even though I spend a night in a Holiday Inn. Um, <laughs> but I, I'm just saying that we need to rethink these strategies, and we need better education. I was at the, uh, uh, there was that, that wall of, of uh, opioid uh, overdose victims uh, that was on the White House grounds yeah. for a while. And, uh, and, and we were just talking there about what an incredible national tragedy this is. And, and they had a, a group there that had a sticker you could put on your insurance card that basically says, ask me before you give me opioids. Hmm. And you think about if, if insurance companies just did that, I'm not trying to mandate anything new here necessarily, but you think about just, just that, because I don't think the, the, the patient trusts the physician. And you get a bottle of pills and they say, hmm. take them. Right. You, you were trained to do that. Right. And so I, I think we all have to, to walk back and kind of the ask why. Thank you for I that. I think we'll help. And then Joe. I, I mean, I think, I don't think we do a very good job in this country we never have at dealing with drugs. I mean, we, we've always looked at it in a, in a punitive criminal justice way of looking at it. We've never looked at it holistically and at the community level. So I guess I'm gonna be optimistic. I hope that this opioid epidemic reframes that and, it, and gives us some opportunities to, because it's affecting other demographics that haven't been affected by a large scale drug epidemic before, um, maybe some good will come out of that. Um, and I also think that we just need to, we need to get data to the people who need it. And when that data is available, we need to actually listen to what the public very clearly says that they need to know. And that's sometimes really hard for those of us in public health because we have to kind of loosen the reins and not just tell them what we think that they need to know. Thank you, thank you. I have three comments, short ones, and then we're at, the U.S. Surgeon General said better health through better partnerships, and so that has come up here. The other piece, and this is an observation, and I think it's a fact, we are each other's community. So we should all figure out a way to take action and what that looks like. And finally, a couple weeks ago, I was at a, a forum focused on chronic pain. There was physicians, there was doctors, there was a nice cross-section. And one physician talked about in the use of technology and prevention and interventions and all of our approaches, we're all open in this time of where we are in life to new things and new ways. But sometimes it also means we have to let go of the old ways. And so to make more room and opportunity and letting go of that mindset, it could be of what stigma and what forms that, but there's different things or the words that we use. There's different ways we can all chip away. It's not always just being in a position of power. It's all that powers as even individuals in each other's community. So I can't thank all of you enough for being on this panel, for the work you're doing, for the stories you're sharing, and for the resilience to keep at it. And I look forward to continuing our work together and digging in further and bringing more people along with us. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Nice job. Thank you.